Thomas Sowell has taught economics, intellectual history, and social policy at such, such institutions as Cornell, UCLA, and Amherst. The author of more than a dozen books, Dr. Sowell is now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. His latest work, a new edition, the fifth edition of his classic work, Basic Economics. Tom Sowell, welcome. Thank you. Why, it, it is a point of pride with you that this book does not contain charts and graphs and calculus and regression analyses. Why is that important to you? Because I want people to read it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you make it unreadable, they're not going to read it. Two sentences from Basic Economics. Life does not ask us what we want. It presents us with options. Why would you put those two sentences in the introduction to an economics text? Because so many people, when they, they think about economic uh, issues, uh, act as if we have a sort of a whole rainbow of, of options out there, and that we can just pick a little bit here and a little there and so forth. And no, the, 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 the options that we have are usually much more limited, and we have to realize that whatever we do will be within those constraints. So economics, as, as construed by Dr. Sowell, is choices and conditions of scarcity. Yes. It's essentially a tragic discipline. You always want more than you have or more than you can get. Yes. You, you're hap I was expecting a little pushback here, but you're, you're happy to call it the dismal science. Uh, no, no. no. Uh, li li uh, the science isn't dismal. Life is, may, may be dismal. But the fact is that we have to operate within the constraints that we have. And if we, and if we think we, are, we have a much wider range, we're going to make some very foolish mistakes. All right. Thomas Sowell, economist, point A. In 1948, as a young man who had dropped out of high school, you tried out for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, my, you're bringing it. We have. I want you to know, Tom, nothing you have done since elicits greater admiration on my part. <laughs> you tried out for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Point B. In 1958, you graduated from Harvard. How did you get from A to B? I flunked the uh, uh, tryout with the Dodgers. <laughs> I mean, I, I came to the, I came in there and I looked at this uh, short right field wall. I said, oh boy, I'll hit. And there was an old building behind the wall with, you know, abandoned. I said, well, I'll, I'll hit a few through those windows. And, you know, and uh, then I learned that the Dodgers gave you, gave you a fielding test first. And only those who passed the fielding test got the bat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, 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 I uh, uh, sal salved my uh, feelings by, by reminding myself that they lost Johnny Mize doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But 1948, you're a kid who's been grown up substantially in Harlem. Mm -hmm. You went to a good high school, but you were forced to drop out. And 10 years later, you graduate from Harvard University. What, what is the chain of events that leads somewhere along the way, somebody discovered that young Thomas Sowell was a very bright kid? How did this happen? Actually, nobody discovered that. Uh, I, I just persisted. Uh, and and uh, uh, at some point, uh, I decided I would apply to Harvard. Had I known uh, uh, then what I know now, I would have realized the odds were hopelessly against it. Uh, but fortunately, since I didn't know, I went ahead and that, that's it. And the degree with which you graduated from Harvard University was a degree in economics. Yes. So that interest in economics declared itself early in your life. How? It was the, it was the subject in which I did the best. I mean, it was, it was a no-brainer. It came, it, it, economics of all things came easily to you, naturally yes, to you? Yes, yes. It made sense, which not everything taught at Harvard uh, made sense at the time, or now. Okay. Now, you've also written that throughout your 20s, you were a Marxist. Yes. What did that to you? Was that Fair Harvard's work? No, heavens no. That, that was uh, when I was uh, 20 years old. Uh, that was when I first came across some stuff by Marx. Uh, and what he said seemed to uh, explain the world around me. And one of the reasons is that, uh, like many kids then and now, they don't really get any alternative explanation. And so it's like you, you have to have a candidate to beat a candidate. So what was, uh, you grew up in Harlem, mm -hmm. you went to Howard before going to Harvard. Yes. So you're largely in a, in a black world, an African-American world. When you say Marx explained the world around you, does, do you mean to say that he explained the world of segregation? No, well, no, no. But, but for example, my first job uh, was as a Western Union messenger. 
I was 16 years old, my first full-time job. And uh, I used to, uh, uh, on some evenings, come home, instead of taking the subway, which was a nickel in those days, uh, I would splurge and take the Fifth Avenue bus, which was 15 cents. If I was feeling, you know. You've gotten a good tip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so it, it was, we'd start off from 23rd Street and go all the way up Fifth Avenue, past, past all the gla gla glittering places. And we would turn left at 57th Street and go out past more glittering places, including Carnegie Hall. Right. And then we'd turn up uh, to, to, at Ground Columbus Circle, up Broadway, and then out to Riverside Drive, and all the fancy stuff there. And then uh, at 135th Street, we'd come in off a of viaduct, and immediately there'd be the tenements. And of course, this is where I live. And I went, what, what, what is this? And uh, 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 Mark seems to, seemed to explain that. Got it. So what, what converted you? You graduate from Harvard a Marxist. Mm -hmm. You remain a Marxist throughout your 20s. And you've written that you had a summer job in Washington in 1969. Uh, 1960. 1960, I beg your pardon. In 1960, mm -hmm that helped to, or that, well, that just changed your views on yes. economics. Well, explain that. Uh, I, mean, I was still a Marxist after taking Mil Milton Friedman's course. Uh, but I, I but, went into, I, but, but <laughs> one, one summer in the government was enough to let me say, you know, this government is really not the answer. I mean, that is... <laughs> Milton Friedman didn't cure you, but the federal government the did. The federal government did. So never say the federal government doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was it in, about the job? Well, I, 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 what, my job was to look, look at, to study minimum wage uh, setting in, in Puerto Rico. And of course, there and I discovered that as they kept raising the minimum Department of Labor, or uh, yes. you're collecting statistics for some. Okay. Yeah, All right, got and for a report, report. Right. Uh, and and I, I noticed that as they kept raising the minimum wage, the, the employment kept going down. And of course, the economics was saying that was why. But the uh, there were two theories. The uh, uh, um, the, the, the unions and, uh, said that uh, the reason it was going down was that uh, there were hurricanes came through, a series of hurricanes uh, during the time they collected the data, and that uh, it destroyed the, the sugar cane in the field so there was less required to be processed. And so the question is, which of those is right? And I, and I thought I'd been trained in Chicago that if there are two different theories, there must be some factual thing that would be different Right. At least in principle. So I spent the whole summer trying to figure out what, 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 how would I test this? And finally I came in one day and announced to the little group there in the office that I have it. That what we need are statistics on the amount of sugar cane standing in the field before the, before the hurricane came through. And I'm waiting for the congratulations and I can see look of, looks of shock in the room like this idiot has stumbled on something that will ruin us all. You know? <laughs> And I realized I was concerned as to whether this law was beneficial or not beneficial to low-income people. They were concerned because this law was providing one-third of the income of the U.S. Department of Labor. And once you begin to see that the government agencies have their own self-interest, quite aside from what it, whatever they're theoretically supposed to be doing. So they were behaving precisely as a neoclassical, precisely as Milton Friedman would have predicted, they were in pursuit of their own incentives. That's right. They didn't want, they weren't trying to, they were not trying to establish justice on the face of the earth. They were trying to hold on to pretty good jobs. Yes. Got it.